Good evening, everyone. I'm going to talk about what we know about the diet of uh, Cretaceous birds and what we can infer based on this knowledge about the evolution of the modern avian digestive system. So the avian fossil record in the Mesozoic is extremely fragmentary, and this is because birds are typically small animals that have hollow bones, and so they don't uh, survive the processes of typhonomy very well. However, if you guys are familiar with the Jehol biota, you know that in this biota, it provides a taphonomic window into the biology of aves, and there are thousands and thousands of specimens that allow us to explore this one avi fauna, at least in extreme detail. So there are thousands of specimens, and the specimens that make, them, make their way into museum collections are typically very complete. And when you have thousands of specimens, you have things like uh, typically rare soft tissue traces and dietary traces suddenly become quite common. So when you have 200 specimens of one taxon to compare with 100 specimens of another species to compare with, say, 50 specimens of yet another taxon, you, that, and all of which together span a good section of the known phylogeny, you actually begin to see some patterns that start to emerge. So what I'm going to be talking about today is the culmination of all the data that we have currently available. Available. So those, for those of you who are not familiar with the Jehol biota, uh, it's from the early Cretaceous. It spans three formations um, from the Hua Jiying to the Yishan to the Jiufotong that span approximately um, a 10.7 million years. And we see increasing avian diversity through time. So it culminating with the Jiufotong formation, which is the richest avifauna, Cretaceous avifauna currently known to science. So the Jehol avifauna includes uh, taxa like Jeholornis, which have a long bony tail. They're only more derived than Archaeopteryx, as well as the most primitive known basal pygostylians, which are Confucius ornis and Sapiornis, and the earliest known ornithothoracines, which include the Enantiornithines, which are the dominant clade of Cretaceous land birds, as well as the Ornituromorpho, which is the clade that includes Neornithes, modern birds nested within. To put the Jeho biota in a chronological context, you can see that the Hua Jiying formation, which is the oldest layer of the Jeho uh, that produces the Jeho biota, is the second oldest avi avian fossil bearing deposit in the world, only younger than uh, the fossil bearing uh, the deposits that have yielded Archaeopteryx. And you can see these other two taxa that I've noted on uh, this time scale are the only other two ta uh, avian taxa from around the world that preserve direct evidence of diet. So you can see that the, amount, the data that we have is very skewed towards the early Cretaceous, which makes it very difficult for us to make uh, hypotheses about broad trends throughout the entire Cretaceous. Of course, it doesn't stop us. And I've also noted the Yan Liao biota here, which is from basically the same region that produces the Jehol biota. And it has also produced, while it doesn't include aves, at least the way I consider it, it doesn't, uh, the, way, the way I think about it, it doesn't preserve aves. Some people consider Anki to be a bird. But anyways, it also uh, produces a lot of specimens that are very important and do uh, reveal some information that is key in order to understanding the, the evolution of the digestive system in aves. So I'm going to be talking about what we know about the um, trophics uh, of Cretaceous birds. And the reason that I'm interested in early avian diet is because modern birds, neornithines, are characterized by a highly specialized digestive system and feeding mechanism. So it is a digestive system that is incredibly light, incredibly efficient, and it's able to meet the high caloric demands of powered flight. So it is characterized by a number of specialized features that you don't see in any other aminoid. For example, the stomach is specialized into two chambers. So you have the proventriculus or the glandular stomach, followed by the ventriculus or the muscular stomach. And in some birds, the ventriculus is further specialized into a grinding gizzard or a gastric mill in which they ingest stones to help them to digest hard to digest things. Um, Aves are also uh, characterized by a uh, specialized esophagus that is basically turned into a pouch that allows them to store more so that they can eat and store more food than they are capable of digesting at any given time. And birds are further characterized, at least some birds are further characterized by bidirectional peristalsis, which allows them to 
move food from the crop down to the ventriculus and then back up again and ingest hard to digest items. So you'll see things, uh, birds like carnivorous birds, piscivorous birds, and insectivorous birds will ingest pellets of uh, items that are difficult to digest. And this reduces the overall residency time as well as reduces the weight of the digestive system while during feeding, which is of course advantageous to flight. Now, um, the Jehol has uh, a num so thousands of specimens, and this allows us to reconstruct the digestive system in numer numerous lineages and in individual lineages of birds, which we then can compare to each other, and then we can better, under under better understand the evolution of the modern digestive system. Now, um, from outside the Jehol, what do we generally know about digestion in dinosaurs? We know from the large, the disparate lineages of dinosaurs that we see using a gastric mill, utilizing gastrolus, we know that a two-part stomach is plesiomorphic to the Silurosauria. But what we also know from coprolites and stomach contents, that, like stomach contents that include acid-etched bones and coprolites that include bits of bone as well as feathers and things, based on this data, we know that basal Silurosaurs are characterized by long residency times and they appear unable able to ingest hard to uh, digest items. Now, the Jehol pres uh, does not only preserve uh, excellent information about birds, it also gives us a lot of uh, direct evidence about the closest living relatives to birds. So for example, uh, Oviraptorosauria is the basal most clade of Peniraptorans, and we know from specimens from the Jehol that at least basal members of this clade were herbivorous because they preserve a really large gastric mill with a large number of gastrolis inside. Uh, Microraptor, which is another volant dromaeosaurid, we know was an opportunistic predator, and this is based on direct evidence of mammals, birds, uh, fish, and yet unpublished lizards inside the stomach. And these specimens also tell us that like living carnivorous birds, Microraptor most likely ate its prey whole or in very large chunks. Now, until recently, we had no evidence of what troodontids were feeding on. And troodontids are most likely the clade that is close, most close closely related to birds. However, even though in the absence of direct evidence, we noticed a huge disparity of tooth morphologies that hinted at then a disparity of, of dietary niches. Now, uh, very recently, there was evidence published for the troodontid uh, Anchiornis, which is from the Yanliao biota and is known from about 230 specimens. And four of these 230 specimens preserve direct evidence of ingested pellets. And this one that's pictured here, you can see the ingested pellet is in situ within the esophagus and consists of a dense aggregate of bones. And in this case, it's about um, three different individual lizards that are contained here. And there are three other specimens that preserve uh, pellets that are not in situ, but they're associated with a skeleton. And these consist of um, fish bones. Now, one thing that's really interesting is that we have about the same number of specimens of Microraptor, and there is no evidence that Microraptor was capable of ingesting hard to digest items. And the other thing that is really interesting is that if you look at Anchiornis, Okay, first of all, sorry, let me back up. Another thing that's really interesting is if you look at the bones in these pellets, you see very limited acid etching. So this, again, shows us that animals that are ingesting items have very low or very minimal residency times for the food that they're, in, that they're uh, consuming. Now, the other thing that is really important about this specimen is, you know, three of the four specimens that preserve direct evidence of diet preserve fish bones. But if you were to look at the general morphology, the skeletal morphology, and the integumentary morphology of Anchiornis, you would never say, this is a piscivore. So this is really important because it really shows us that in the absence of direct evidence, we must use extreme caution when we are inferring diet based on skeletal indicators. So um, I think this recent paper is really important, and I uh, recommend everybody to check it out, um, primarily because it has this really funny picture of uh, Anchiornis lighting the candle at both ends. So Archaeopteryx is uh, one of the most important or uh, 
avian specimens from the Mesozoic, there's only 12 specimens and none of these preserve direct evidence of diet. So therefore we are forced to look at skeletal indicators um, of, of diet which are basically the morphology of the feeding apparatus. So this is in birds mostly the cranium but also to a lesser degree the arms and the feet. Now as you saw with Anchiornis we must exercise caution however since Archaeopteryx is so important and there are no direct evidence we are still going to risk making some inferences. Uh, recently published, there was this tooth uh, that has been assigned to the Archaeopterygidae, and if this assignment is correct, then it tells us that the, the teeth of Archaeopteryx were not these simple peg-like teeth that we have so commonly said within the literature for over a hundred years. These teeth are actually characterized by delicate crina, which show us I don't know what they show us, to be honest. But it shows us that teeth are not as simple as we thought, uh, previously thought they were in Aves. Jehlornis prima is the second most primitive bird within the avian tree, only more derived than Archaeopteryx, and the holotype of this taxon preserved a large number of seeds that were described as in the stomach, so we have known that this taxon is an herbivore. And then later specimens of other taxa were described, preserving seeds, and based on comparison with those specimens, I surmise that maybe the seeds preserved in the holotype of Jehlornis were in fact not in the stomach, but actually in the crop. So then I went to the uh, Tianyu Museum, which is the largest dinosaur museum in the world. It has huge collections of fossil birds and fossil dinosaurs. And so I looked through all these specimens, and I found a number of other specimens that also preserve seeds. And based on my observations, I inferred that, in fact, all the specimens preserving seeds, the seeds are inside the stomach, which strongly suggests that Jehlornis lacks a crop. Now, we knew that Jehlornis was an herbivore, but we lacked evidence that its herbivorous diet was paired with a grinding gizzard as, most, as in all living herbivorous birds. So, but when you have such a spectacular collection as you have at the Tianyu Museum, you can go there and you can check and double check these kinds of inconsistencies. So sure enough, I looked at 95 specimens of Jehlornis that are in this collection alone, and we found about six specimens that preserve uh, gastrolis and another six specimens that preserve seeds. The odd thing is that no specimen preserves both. And this actually sort of makes sense because if the seeds were preserved in the ventric, in the stomach, with the gizzard stones, then the seeds would be unlikely to be preserved whole, right? Um, however, there are two explanations for this inconsistency, for the fact that the seeds and the uh, gastrolis are not preserved in any of the sing any same specimen. It could be that we are seeing seasonal changes in diet or um, it could be that we're seeing ontogenetic changes in diet. However, I will say that at this time, neither of these hypotheses is well supported because we see gastral masses preserved in taxa and specimens that preserve, that occupy the entire size, known size range of Jehlornis. And also when we look at living birds that have seasonal changes in diet, and sometimes they use gastrolis and sometimes they don't, we tend to see very distinct changes in diet. So it wouldn't be something from seeds to harder seeds, for example. So this is still something that needs requires exploration. Now, Sapiornis is known from 106 specimens, and we have a number of specimens, a handful of specimens that preserve seeds in the crop, and we also have specimens that preserve gastrolis in the ventriculus, and we have some specimens that do preserve both at the same time, uh, like this specimen here. And what you see, the seeds are always preserved in the crop in a very low position, resting on the furcula, which is the exact same thing that you see in the morphology of the crop in living granivorous birds. And so notably, this seems to be the most basal known occurrence of a crop within Aves, and this feature is unknown outside of this clade. Now, Confucius ornithiforms is known from, represented by thousands of specimens, literally thousands of specimens. And a majority of these are referred to Confucius Ornus Sanctus. And this taxon has very robust edentulous jaws, so this led people early on to infer that this taxon is probably an herbivore. However, this is not paired with any evidence for gastric mill in any of these thousands of specimens. And I will admit that I've seen one specimen that had gastrolis artificially added to the slab, but uh, don't worry, like these farmers, they're, they're pretty crafty, but they can't trick me. Um, however, there is one specimen that has been published claiming that 
Confucius Ornus is Episcopal, and it, ha it points to the small aggregation of fish bones that preserved near the neck that it seems to be like it's in the crop prior to egestion, right? However, there's only this one single specimen that seems to suggest this, and we have thousands of other specimens that show no hint at such uh, a diet. So. Given the fact that we have tons of fish material preserved within the gel hole, I think that this association here is most likely preservational. And uh, so in the absence of direct evidence, there have been a large number of hypotheses proposed for the diet of, um, of Confucius Ornus. Most recently this year, um, Elzanowski suggested that maybe it was a Sally striking predator. I had to look up what that meant. Um, and I don't actually have any, uh, any qualms with that hypothesis, though I do disagree with some of the cranial interpretations. Now, Enantiomonithes is the most diverse clade in the Jehol and also in the entire Cretaceous av avian fossil record. And it outnumbers, it, it accounts for you know, most, most of the diversity of birds within the Jehol, but it also accounts for the greatest number of specimens, even more specimens than we have for uh, the Confucius ornithiformes. And despite this huge wealth of, of specimen uh, data, there are only two specimens from the Jehol that even preserve purported direct evidence of diet. So uh, the first one here, it's a, a specimen, a referred specimen of Bohiornis, and it is described as preserving wrangle, which, is, which are stones that are ingested by living carnivorous birds that help clean out the digestive system. However, when you compare this purported wrangle to gastroliths in other known Jeho birds, you can see morphological differences, and I actually interpret this purported wrangle as probably some weird mineral precipitate that I don't fully understand at this time. Uh, the second known specimen that purportedly preserves direct evidence of diet is this specimen here that's been named Piscivore enantiornis, and it's uh, disarticulated, so it immediately calls into question whether or not this pellet is even associated with the specimen. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pellet that contains some small fish bones, which is obviously why it got its name. And, um, so it's been used to suggest, because in previous papers I said that this was not true, but it's been used to suggest that the Nantiornithines in fact had a modern style avian digestive system and that they were also capable of advanced bidirectional peristalsis and they were able to egest hard to digest items. Now, um, if you compare this purported pellet to other known pellets that are preserved in C2, you can see, you can immediately see morphological differences. The purported pellets in Anchiornis and in uh, Ornithiomorph birds like Yanornis are dense aggregates of bone with very little cementum in between, whereas this other pellet consists primarily of cementum. So, and in fact, if you've seen thousands of specimens from the Jeho like I have, you'll notice that these weird oval structures are present in a large number of slabs. Sometimes they occur in a large number numbers, and they're associated with specimens that are sometimes very small, and sometimes you know, they're uh, associated with taxa that are very big. So I interpret these actually to be coprolites of some yet unidentified um, carnivorous fish or some aquatic reptile, but not direct evidence of diet within the enantiornithines. The, there are two specimens from outside China that do uh, purportedly preserve direct evidence of diet for this clade. The first one is an phoenix from Lebanon, and it's been described as preserving these small corpse of pools of amber within this um, concretion uh, that also contains the, the skeleton of this bird. And this has been considered to be direct evidence that this bird was a sap eater. However, if you're familiar with the way that amber forms in the way that amber, yeah the way the amber forms you will you know that this association is probably not indicative of diet now i would say the the best or i would actually say the only direct evidence of diet in the enantiornithines comes from the early cretaceous uh, Las Hoyas deposits of Spain, and in preserved in the only known uh, specimen of Eo alulavis, there are small bits of invertebrates preserved within the uh, abdominal cavity. So I consider this to be direct evidence of diet, but one thing that is really odd is if this was a diet that was widely utilized by the enantiornithines, why are, is there no specimen in the Jehol that preserves similar evidence? It's very odd. 
Now, I've said that there is only this one specimen that preserves direct evidence of diet. However, there are some people who disagree with my interpretation of ovarian follicles preserved in specimen, in, in some specimens of enantiornithines, and they consider these, in fact, to be seeds. So rather than ignore this hypothesis, I'm going to briefly address it. Uh, and I would also like to note that uh, ovarian follicles are also described as being preserved in one specimen of Jehornis and one specimen of Ao Confucius Ornis, which is um, uh, shown here. So um, I'm going to put uh, I'm going to summarize uh, several lines of evidence that I believe put together strongly suggest that I have not misinterpreted the data. So uh, one, when you have specimens that are preserved either in dorsal or ventral view, you always see this aggregate of ovarian follicles preserved on the left side, which is consistent with the absence, the loss of a right ovary within aves. The second is that you know, ovarian follicles are circular, but sometimes in these fossil specimens, you, you observe deformation. And you would not see deformation in seeds because seeds are hard. Another thing is if you compare them to seeds that are directly preserved in specimens of Sapiornis or Jehornis, you'll see that these purported ovarian follicles lack any ornamentation or specific shape like you see in fossil seeds. And also, if these are in fact seeds, it's really odd that they are not per, it is not paired with the presence of gastric mill as you see in, um, sorry, in Sapiornis and also in an Ornithuromorph and there's no, gas, no evidence of a gastric mill in enantiornithines. The second thing is that you see a hierarchy or a, a range of size in the follicles, which you don't see in seeds, which you do see in the ovarian follicles of for example, living birds. And the second thing is that the seeds, seeds in fossils occur in fossil birds occur in large numbers, whereas the ovarian follicles in these specimens can, uh, occur in much smaller numbers, which is uh, consistent with clutch sizes. And um, so, you know, you might still not be convinced by all this data. However, uh, my postdoc, Alida Bayol, has taken one of these specimens and she has um, sampled it. And I actually was not expecting that we would find any uh, biomolecules preserved. But in fact, we had very promising results. So you can look forward in the next year to a paper coming out that will hopefully put to rest any reasonable doubt that is out there. I can't do anything about you guys for being unreasonable, though. So in the absence of any direct evidence within these thousands of specimens of enantiornithines, with the exception of Eualulavis, we are, of course, forced to look at traditional indicators of diet, such as skeletal morphology. And if you look at early Cretaceous enantiornithines, you see a huge diversity of dental morphologies, of dental arrangements, and also rostral morphologies that hint at a really huge diversity of diets. But we don't have any evidence of any of them, so it's very strange. Now, one thing that these uh, specimens have shown us is to really cast aside this idea that you know, teeth in birds were these very simple peg-like structures that were evolutionarily on their way out. And in fact, when we look at these specimens in detail, we see all sorts of enamel specializations that show that imply active selection on, on teeth within early birds. For example, we see grooves on the uh, lingual surface of the teeth in Solcavis and Mono Enantiornis, and also you see these um, crenulations on the distal margin of the teeth in Longipteryx that suggest at least that this latter taxon maybe was some kind of predatorial bird. Now, we also see evidence for enamel specializations in Sapiornis, which also preserves a crop full of seeds and a gastric mill. But we see these weird um, tu uh, tubercles on the teeth, which implies active selection. But also recently, people have noticed that the dentary of Sapiornis preserves two very tiny teeth preceded by three empty alveoli, which also suggests that we have like negative selection, uh, selection for teeth in sapiornis. So something very odd is going on there. And people have suggested that perhaps this is on evidence for ontogenetic tooth loss within sapiornis. However, we see this morphology in small and large specimens, which makes this interpretation unlikely. Within the Ornithuromorpha, despite the fact that this clade is represented by far fewer specimens than the Confucius ornithiforms or enantiornithines, we only have, say, maybe 200 specimens scattered all over China. Despite this fact, seven of 18 known species preserve evidence of diet. And for example, about 
a dozen specimens of Yanornis, which is about half of all known specimens of this taxon, preserve direct evidence that this taxon was a piscivore. So we have inside the esophagus, we have in whole fish as, where, as well as pellets prior, uh, about to be ejected, and we also have in the ventriculus macerated fish, mains, fish remains. So this is the earliest um, strong evidence of bidirectional peristalsis within the Manny Raptorans. So uh, Jan Ornis, despite the fact, you know, we talked about these negative and positive uh, trends within, uh, within um, with tooth loss within um, avies, and Jan Ornis shows us is Jan Ornis has more teeth than any other early Cretaceous bird. So this shows us that there are positive selection for tooth morphologies even within the crown word lineage. And um, this one specimen was described as preserving gastroliths, and this was actually the first specimen from the Jehol to ever preserve this feature, at least the first to ever be reported with this feature. However, when we started to discover additional specimens preserving gastral masses, we started to notice some morphological differences. And this led us to reinterpret these stones within this, uh, these gastrolis within this one specimen of Yanornis as in fact being in the intestines, not the ventriculus, and suggesting that this specimen died of um, intestinal impaction. Uh, of accidentally ingested stones. And this is something that actually uh, causes mortality in about 1% of all shorebirds, which is a similar ecology for what is inferred for Yanornis. Now this hypothesis has been supported by the numerous subsequent discoveries of specimens of Yanornis preserving uh, direct evidence that it was feeding on fish, as well as specimens that did preserve one or two gastrolis in the ventriculus, which is consistent with accidental, uh, accidental ingestion. Um, when we look at the crop of, Jan of Janornis, we see that it is capable of uh, storing large amounts of food, and we also see that it's, it, doesn't, it ha doesn't have a distinct position like the crop in granivores, which is exactly the same thing that we see in living piscivores. We see basically what I call a simple crop. Some people say it's not a crop at all, but it's a highly flexible esophagus capable of expanding to carry considerable loads. Now there's one other taxon of Ornithuromorph from the Jeho that d preserves direct evidence that was a piscivore. However, unfortunately, there's no cranial, uh, cranial material preserved, so we're unable to make any inferences about, uh, you know, about cranial morphology uh, with diet. Now there's only one other specimen of Ornithuromorph that preserves direct evidence of diet, and this is a specimen that was originally assigned to uh, the taxon Hongsharornis. And if you look at these uh, in detail, you can see that similar to the granivorous crop in Sapiornis, we see the crop is same as living birds located just over the furcula. Now, Hongshan ornithids are a very small group of toothed wading birds, so the idea that this taxon would have been, uh, or this group was granivorous, is not really consistent with the inferred ecology. So I took a closer look at this taxon, and sure enough, it's not Hongshan ornithids. It's a distinct taxon. Um, Hongshan ornithids have legs that are longer than its wings. This guy has the opposite pattern. It's also much larger than Hongshan ornithids. And if you look closely at the skull, you can also see it's edentulous. Uh, a number of other specimens don't preserve direct evidence of diet, but they preserve gastrolis, and this is, is an indicator of diet. And when we look at all these specimens together, we actually notice different morphologies of gastral masses, which hint at differences in, in uh, diet. And one thing that we see is that specimens that have a smaller number of larger stones are taxa that still retain their teeth. So this is a pattern that, that is, uh, needs to be explored further. Okay. Um, now, if you know, if you're familiar with theropods, you know that when you know that teeth and a gastral mass are considered to be redundant. And within the theropoda, when you see a presence of a gastral mass, it's always correlated with tooth loss, right? Uh, which we see in Oviraptorosauria or the Ornithomimosaurs. And this is sort of true within basal birds. When you look at uh, Jehornis, it has tooth reduction. When you look at the Piscivorus Yanornis, it has a greater number of teeth. Uh, and then when you look at taxa that have really large gastral masses, you actually see a complete loss of teeth. Um, and the only exception to this was Hongsharonis, which, uh, is, which all Hongsharonis preserve very small teeth, but one specimen preserves gastro mass, so this was a little bit odd because it breaks away from the pattern. However, Hongsharonis is the only specimen that preserves a gastrolis, and it is also basal with Hongshanornithidae, so this suggests that perhaps they were herbivorous and then when they adapted to, into a wading ecology, they secondarily lost this herbivory before they lost teeth. And one thing that I want to point out is that um, all, all gastral masses are not 
the same. And I think this points to an intrinsic difference between the digestive system in basal birds and non-avian dinosaurs and the more derived ornithomorphs. Because if you look at living birds, the size of the gastrolis basically correlates with size. Larger bird, larger gastrolis. But when we look Jehornis, which is a much larger bird than ornithomorphs, it actually has much smaller stones. So like I said, again, this I think points to intrinsic differences in the digestive system. And I've mentioned that we have a lot of seeds preserved in some of these taxa. So what do we know about them? The fact is, we don't know anything, but I'm putting up this out here in case there are any paleobotanists in the room who want to get involved. But one thing that we can say is that we see, um, we know that these taxa were not highly specialized because we see different types of seeds preserved in single taxa. For example, Jehornis preserves about at least three different types of seeds. But one thing we also see is that no species, Sapiornis, Jehornis, and Aogranivora, they all preserve different types of seeds. So this perhaps hints at some kind of um, you know, ecological niche partitioning. So summarizing all this data, when can we say the modern avian digestive system evolved? Well, given that we have a ventrally located crop in Sapiornis, as well as a gastromath, gastromath, a grinding gizzard, we can suggest that here is where um, the modern avian digestive system evolved. However, we know that teeth, including some very bizarre teeth morphology, persisted to the very end of the Cretaceous. So you can actually say that the modern avian feeding mechanism is actually a, is something that is restricted only to Neornithes. So I would like to thank um, all these people listed here, and especially I would like to thank the Paleontological Association for inviting me to give speech.